Well, good morning. It's no small thing following that up. I'll do my best. Uh, I will not break out in song. A uh, little thing that, that some of you may not know about me, I played basketball when I was in middle school. I was very, very good. I scored 11 points once in a season. <laughs> season. I was not very good at basketball. What I was good at was a little bit of defense. I could, I could play defense. Obviously, I had to uh, because obviously not an offensive dynamo. And uh, I remember one time I played for a rec league team. We were called the Bulls, which was big in the 90s to be the Bulls. And I had trapped a kid on the baseline. He picked up his dribble and he hit me with the ball to get the ball to bounce off of me and go out of bounds. I took exception to this. And so I hit him in the face. And we got into a little bit of a scuffle. I was ejected from that game. I was suspended from the next. And because I was on the Bulls, my teammates nicknamed me Dennis Rodman. <laughs> Which, clearly Dennis and I have much in common. Uh, but what I was really worried about was not the damage that I had done to my team, that they would have to play a man down. Clearly they'd be worried about that without me on the team. I was worried about getting in trouble. I was worried that my anger, my frustration, my lack of self-control was going to get me grounded, was going to get me punished from my mom and dad, was going to get me in trouble with my coach, maybe kicked off the team, like all this stuff. And I was not worried one bit about whether or not I hurt the kid. I don't think I even apologized now that I think about it. The consequences that we have from our anger are usually things that we don't want to deal with. And usually the things, the things that keep us from totally unleashing our anger isn't necessarily a great love or affection for other people. It's because we don't want to deal with the fallout and the consequences that comes from it. We've learned to control our anger so that we can navigate life in a society that sometimes likes it and sometimes doesn't. We've learned how to use our anger. And so what I want us to talk about today is I want us to talk about how we can control our anger in a way that is honoring to the Lord, in a way that doesn't just look at the consequences and say, eh, it's not worth it to get upset about it. Because that's still selfish. It is still a selfish way to go about our anger. We're going to be in Proverbs, and I think it's appropriate that we're following on the heels of the conversation we had last week on conflict resolution. And this week we're in 14, Proverbs 14, 29 to 30. We're going to be in quite a few other passages because the Proverbs have a lot to say about anger. But what I want you to see is if we're going to really use anger, if, if anger is going to be this thing that's a part of our life, but we're going to control it, we're going to wrestle with it, we've going to have, we're going to have to use our whole bodies. We're going to have to use every part of us our emotions, our bodies, and our minds against anger. And so first, patience has to rule our emotions. Patience has to rule our emotions. Our culture likes anger. We live in an angry culture. I don't think anybody would really deny that. Uh, we just had an election this week, and I think I saw countless ads that were like, so-and-so's too dangerous for Texas. So-and-so's. I'm like, dangerous? Like, what are we talking about here? Like, What's dangerous look like? Like, I've got a different definition of dangerous, right? But that's designed to evoke a response. I'm supposed to get mad at this person that I've probably never heard of until election season to be like, yeah, maybe they, maybe they are too dangerous. Maybe they are. And I'm supposed to get angry about it. We like anger. Anger's a useful tool. If I go into a store... And there's a big long line, it's Christmas, it's coming up on Christmas season, right? I'm going to return some stuff, I'm going to buy some things. If I start making a stink, I start, I'm not getting the kind of service that I want. Sometimes in a retail environment, and I know this because I worked in retail for eight years, they'll be like, can I just take care of this person real quick? They're kind of causing a scene. And you know, the more, the nicer people, the, the more chill people are like, yeah, it's fine, trust me, like we're super uncomfortable too. And so you can just fake anger and get what you want. Anger is an effective tool. It's useful in our society. And so I think one of the reasons why we, don't, we have, live in a more angry culture is not because we're angrier than we have been years before. I mean, we fought a civil war at one point. Like, that's anger. I think we recognize that anger is useful. We live in a utilitarian culture. 
And if we can use something, it sticks around. If we can't, we get rid of it. And anger has its uses. It's a tool in our society. But the scriptures do not view anger as a tool. Instead, the scriptures view anger this way. Look at verse 29 to 30. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a nasty temper exalts folly. A hasty temper, excuse me. Nasty works too. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Anger is destructive, particularly if it's arrived at quickly. There's this correlation that the proverb is describing here, drawing between life and patience and death and anger. You see, in the Proverbs, wisdom is associated with being slow. If you're slow to, to, to anger, if you're contemplative, if you seek understanding, if you ask questions, if you're not uh, reactive, that's associated with wisdom in the Proverbs. But if you're hasty, if you're quick-tempered, if you're reckless, if you make rash decisions, well, guess what? That's seen as foolishness. That's seen as foolishness. And the reason why this is, is because God is seen as patient. God is a patient God. He's not quick, tempered, not hasty, right? I mean, how long was Israel in slavery before he acted? It was 400 years. 400 years. How long was it between Adam and Eve's sin and the sending of his son Jesus to die for us? Thousands of years. God is not hasty. And so when we control our emotions, when we control our anger, we show the world what God is like. Maybe one of the reasons why people think that God is angry and wrathful is because they see his people who seem pretty wound up about stuff sometimes. When you rush into anger, when you fly off the handle, you're no longer worshiping God. You're no longer uh, uh, glorifying him. You're not exalting him. Instead, look what the scripture says. In verse 29, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. That word exalt is glorify, worship. Your God is foolishness if you are quick-tempered. That's what the passage is saying. You're not showing what the world is like. And for too long as a people, we have indulged foolishness and called it useful. You see, God is a God of peace. He's a God of tranquility. He's a God of rest. Look what verse 30 says. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. It should not be a big surprise that when we act like our creator, when we bear his image well, we give life to the situations that we're in. And when we don't do that, when we decide to reject his ways, when we reject his teachings, and we do the things that we want to do, it creates death. Life is sucked out because we were designed to honor and worship him and to show him to the rest of the world. Now, the temptation is to look at this metaphorically. It's to say, yeah, I guess so. Like when I'm, when I'm calm and more patient, I'm, not, I'm gonna be more life-giving to my relationships, my family, my friends, my job. But there's real physical evidence here. The writer of Proverbs is telling us something that science has proven since, that anger has a negative impact on your health, your physical health. I did some research this week which is not new. I research every week for this. Just want to let y'all know. I'm not just like writing stuff. In the two hours after having an outburst, the risk of a heart attack doubles. You're three times as likely to have a stroke. If you're someone who's mad all the time, you kind of operate at like this low simmer, your immune system is likely compromised. You don't fight disease as well. Anxiety and depression create anger in a person, but they also feed off of it. If you're angry, you'll be worried. Ongoing, short-fused anger decreases the lung capacity of the person who deals with that. At the end of the day, anger, uncontrolled, unbridled, lack of patience in your emotional anger can shorten your life. 
it will kill you to be angry. And I can't think of a worse way to tell the world that our God is life-giving, that our God is the source of life, that God is pro-life, than to shorten our own lives by being angry all the time. One of the worst things you can say about our God is to say that he is not a God of life. But we say it all the time when we refuse to control our anger. Patience has to rule our emotions. It has to rule over our anger. And patience doesn't mean that you're not angry. There are times when it is justified, it is righteous to be angry. Anger by itself is not a sin. God gets angry. We read Ephesians. It says, in your anger, do not sin. That clearly states that there are times when you can be angry and not sin. One of my favorite stories from the Gospel of John is in John 2.15, Jesus is going to turn over the tables in the temple. He's going to drive out the money changers from the temple. But before he does that, he leaves the temple, goes, sits on the steps, and starts making a whip. And I imagine the conversation with the disciples went something like this. Hey, Jesus, what you doing? Making a whip. Cool. What you going to do with it? I'm going to go hit some people and get them out of the temple. Okay, you need help with that? No, I'm good. Okay, we're gonna go get some lunch. You just join us afterwards, I guess. Like, what was that like? Now, I'm not a lawyer, clearly, but the act of fashioning a weapon and then using it, I'm sure, could be used in a trial of some premeditation on Jesus' part. But that is a man in control of his anger. And why is he so mad? Why is he sitting there simmering? Jesus gets mad about two things to show us what righteous anger looks like. He gets mad when people who can't defend themselves are treated badly. The poor and the oppressed are treated badly. And he gets mad when people who say they worship God are hypocritical. And that's why he's mad in the temple. They are defaming and discrediting the name of God. And Jesus isn't putting up with it. Does Jesus get mad when they beat him? No. Does Jesus get mad when they nail him to a cross? No. He never gets angry when people treat him poorly. And that shows you where righteous anger and unrighteous anger is the difference. What drives you nuts? I am really slow to anger. I'm very patient. When I see other people treated badly, I'm like, well, they probably, you know, there's conflict involves both people. Nobody's 100% right. I'm very slow to anger when I see people who are, are, call themselves followers of Christ, but, but kind of, you know, don't exactly live the way they should. I'm very patient and slow. But somebody cuts me off in traffic. And I've had enough. Somebody calls me a name. Somebody says something rude to me. It's very different. It probably shows you where you're, what really makes you angry. What sparks the emotion in you of anger? And is it whenever your rights, your privileges, your perceived needs and desires are stepped upon? And if that's the case, patience does not rule your emotions. The way you respond to anger shows you probably how closely you are walking to the Lord. Anger is an excellent litmus test for how devoted we are to God. Because if we are slow to anger, we will be like him. If we are quick to anger, probably some some introspection that needs to take place. But it's not just emotions. Uh, Our bodies react. Our bodies get involved in the act of anger as well. So self-control has to rule over our bodies. It's something that's, self-control is praised across every philosophy, every discipline. Even the most hedonistic person will say, hey, you do need to be, uh, pace yourself when you're eating and drinking as much as you want because you don't want to be sick, right? You you want to, you want to enjoy it. And Proverbs praises self-control. And verses 16, 32 and 29, 22 talks about the place of anger, or sorry, the place of self-control in the realm of anger. And the bottom line is this, your emotions will display themselves in physical anger. Physical anger. Now you might be like, well, Travis, I don't 
hit anybody. I don't throw anything. I don't lash out like that. Oh, really? Do you say things? Because the act of saying something is a physical act. You push breath across your lips and you move your tongue. That is a physical act. Speaking is a physical act. Typing an email, writing a letter is a physical act. An angry review on on Yelp is a physical act. Anger will always manifest itself some way physically. And there's really two effects that this has. The first is talked about in 1632. It says this, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Now, at first, when you read this, you think, oh, that makes total sense. If I can control my anger, if I can get out of my own way, if I can learn to put up with this boss that drives me nuts, if I can stuff my anger down, I'll have a more successful marriage. There's, there's good things that can happen if I can control my anger in my life. I can conquer the world if I can just not lash out so much. You're still making the same mistake. Anger is utilitarian. You're making the same mistake that we made before. Anger has its uses. It doesn't have its uses. I'm getting rid of it. That is not what the text is saying. The Bible is saying that the usefulness of a person to the community, to the people, is based on how self-controlled they are. A self-controlled person, a person who controls their emotions, controlled their bodies, is of more use to a community, to a society, than a person who conquers cities, than a military or political leader. Think about that. A self-controlled person is of more value. Your ability to limit yourself, to tell yourself no, to let your emotions not rule your body is a greater contribution to the people you live with than somebody who turns the gears of politics or turns the gears of war. Some of us have seen, I'm sure, at some point, a toddler throwing a tantrum, right? It's kind of simultaneously annoying and precious and hilarious all at the same time because you're like really angry about something and and like, but at the same time, it's always in a public place. And if you're a parent, you're just kind of like, I don't know. Somebody come get, I don't know whose kid this is. Is is your kid? Well, he looks just like, hey, it's not mine. But a a toddler throwing a temper tantrum really can't hurt anybody. I mean, if you go to like pick them up, they might lash out at you and hit you with those soft little pudgy fists. And that can hurt. But the truth of the matter is like, they're not going to do a great deal of damage throwing a fit. But let's fast forward in that toddler's life about 40 or 50 years. And that person never learned self-control, but they're now the CEO of a company. And they still get angry at the drop of a hat. They still don't know how to control their anger. Great deal of damage can be done. Great deal of damage. And some of us are thinking, okay, I can stuff my emotions. I can, I can bite my tongue once or twice a week. That's not bad. You see, the measure of real self-control is not self-control in a moment. It's self-control over time. Look back at the passage. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You see, in the ancient world, if you wanted to conquer a city, you laid siege to it. If it had walls, you just closed it off from the rest of the world. Your army surrounded it, and you wouldn't let food or water or news get into the city. But your army outside the city was just as vulnerable. They need food, your army needs food. They need water, your army needs water. Disease, just as likely to strike your army as theirs. One of their armies could show up out of nowhere and surprise you while you're all encamped. Your kingdom back home, while you're laying siege to this city for months and months and months, might all of a sudden decide, you know what? Our king's been gone a long time. We could probably do a better job without him. A siege is a test of wills. Who's going to break first? Who's going to snap first? Who has the determination to keep things under control? It's self-control over time. Anger, emotion, they're not bad things. Not at all. But if we don't keep them in check, you're losing the battle. 
and you're losing the war, to successfully uh, handle that. You have to, that, that is a way to benefit your society. It's to keep yourself in check over time. But on the other hand, anger can have a negative effect on people. It can be just as damaging to a society as it can be beneficial. Look at 29.22. 29.22 says this, A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. Again, we think individually. We're like, okay, yeah, somebody who's mad probably says things they don't mean. They, they, they might blaspheme. They might say something terrible, and they have to apologize or ask for forgiveness from the Lord. Okay, I got it. But think about angry people. What do they do? They provoke. They provoke an angry response. They provoke people. And so you can lead somebody else into sin. You can lead somebody else into temptation. You can lead somebody else into destruction. Because your anger has provoked them. They, all of a sudden, I'm tired of it, and they lash back out at you. Well, now you've both sinned. You've both fallen short. You've both dishonored the name of the Lord. And the person who provokes them has more to blame. Anger is a destructive thing. It's a destructive thing. It catches on. Anger destroys life. It diminishes worship. Why? Because people are so concerned with not offending you and walking on eggshells around you that they cannot give contemplation to the care and the needs of other people, their own spiritual needs, and the worship and honor of God. Your anger sets you up as a wrathful God who demands to be pleased in the lives of other people. It causes much transgression because people just want you to be happy so that they can be at peace. It's the same way people treated the ancient gods of old. We don't want our gods to be angry at us, so we're going to make sacrifices. And that's what you demand. You're a pagan god if that's what you do for people. And so these two together tell us something. Our anger, we have to have physical control of our anger because anger affects our bodies. And I just don't mean like it affects our corporate bodies. It affects corporate people. It affects our communities, our societies. If you want better communities, better societies, better homes, control the anger. We want to know why our society is so mad. Look yourself in the mirror and say, Travis, why am I so mad? Why am I so angry? The world is much more peaceful when people are less angry. And it shouldn't be a surprise because God designed the world and designed us to be like him. And so when we are reflecting his character, things are better. Unbridled anger damages communities. And it's not just because, oh, we hurt people's feelings. It's because it's a tool of manipulation. I can get people to do what I want by lashing out or choosing not to lash out. And the more uncertain people are in the way I'm going to respond, the more they are forced to walk on eggshells, and the more I can manipulate them. Anger pins back righteousness. And you, you see it in Scripture. Saul uses anger to turn an entire nation against David, their hero. Jonah uses anger to convince himself that Nineveh deserves to be destroyed. The religious leaders get the Jewish people who hated the Romans and the Romans who hated the Jews to combine them, their forces to destroy the Jews on Messiah. Anger is a powerful tool. The 1930s are rife with leaders using anger and blaming people to get what they want, stay in power. We have to not let anger rule our bodies so that it doesn't rule our bodies. Let me say that again. Anger cannot rule our bodies so that it does not rule our bodies. Our governments, our societies, our churches, especially our churches. Anger doesn't need to rule our church. Jesus is the ruler of our church, and one of his titles is the Prince of what? Peace. Thank you. The chapel didn't give me quite a response last hour, so thank you. That was nice. Prince of Peace. 
Let peace rule our bodies. And when you let it rule your body, it starts to rule this body. Many times we're ashamed to take our anger to the Lord. You know why I don't like to take my anger to the Lord? Can I just be confessional for a minute? Because Jesus is going to tell me to, that I'm wrong. Like, I want to talk to people who are going to agree with me, and I want Jesus to be like, yeah, you have every right to be mad about that. Your wife is trying to do terrible things to you. No, she's not. If you've met my wife, she doesn't have like a terrible bone in her body. She's like the sweetest person in the world. You've got to go to Jesus with your anger. And I know you're ashamed, and I know that maybe you want people to, 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 to tell you that you're right. But can I surprise you with what I think you'll hear from the Lord if you really listen to him? If you really listen to him, you'll be surprised to hear him say, I understand. You were not supposed to be treated that way. The world wasn't supposed to be this way. You'll hear him say, yeah, I was treated badly too. And it was frustrating. But son, daughter, look at the way that I responded. Because the way that you were being treated was the way that they treated me, and you were a part of that. You were one of the ones that treated me this way, even if you hadn't been there directly. That's what sin does. Forgive. Let, take your anger to the Lord. And I know that sounds really basic, but I think it's a basic step that we miss because in our anger, we don't like to go to the Lord. It's the same thing that we have with lust. We feel really weird going to Jesus with lust because we think he looks at us like, you disgusting thing. And again, I think there's surprise waiting on us. I don't think we think anger is as big of a deal as it is. It is just as destructive as lust is because it's about passion. Lust is destructive because it's passionate. Anger is destructive because it's passionate. Sexual desire in the right context is a good thing. Anger in the right context is a good thing. Outside of those contexts, we have to bring it before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, what is going on with my body? We have to listen to him. And quickly, I'd like to say the third uh, component that's important is our mind. Listening has to rule our minds. Look at verse 24 and 25 of chapter 22. It says, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Bruce Waltke says this, uh, an angry person, a person given to anger, has their judgment clouded by irrational thought, they lose all sense of proportion, they act impetuously, and they're incapable of measured utterance. And this is what happens to us when we spend a lot of time with angry people. When we listen to angry people, our minds get warped. Our minds get shaped by their anger. And unfortunately, we live in a world where people have a lot further reach. Back in the ancient world, this passage was literally, don't be friends with angry people. And you're like, okay, I'm going to stop going to my neighbor's house. We just still get mad at the same things. But in our day and age, anger reaches us in a lot of different ways. Let me ask you this question. Do you watch the news and does it make you mad? Or are you just like, oh, that's interesting. Interesting fact. Thank you, news, for letting me know this. It's a good fact. No, we get mad. We're like, ah, again. If you can't watch the news without getting angry, can I offer a humble suggestion? Stop watching the news. Trust me, if it's bad enough, you'll find out about it. If something goes real south, trust me, you'll see people running. Just turn and run with them. Ask questions while you go. It'll be fine. How about sports? You get mad at sports? I have a book at home that I had to get for seminary. I've never looked at it since, but it stays with me for one reason. The spine is broken. You know why the spine is broken? It's a reminder that at one time, a team that I was rooting for lost on a last second field goal and I slammed it on the concrete floor of my apartment and broke the book. It is a testimony that sports should not make me mad. Let me tell you this, I have great news. Your team will perform no better or worse 
depending on your emotional investment in said team. <laughs> your team's bad, you get angry, guess what? They're still bad and you're angry. It's not gonna help you. If you can't watch sports without getting mad, find a new hobby, perhaps gardening. Give it up. Are there things that you can't talk about without getting mad? Are there friends that you can't hang around that make you mad? What about your job? Does your job make you more angry than satisfied? Can I offer another radical solution? Get a new job. It's not worth it. Anger is destructive and it warps our mind. And when we're around other people who are angry, it warps us too. And here's the thing. The only person it didn't do that to was Jesus. Look again at the passage. It says, make no friendship with a man given to anger. By the way, that's all of us. Nor go with a wrathful man. Again, all of us. Lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Jesus did the one thing that nobody else could do. He didn't learn our ways. He comes to earth, he's around a whole bunch of angry people in the midst of a volatile, angry time in history. I mean, Palestine in the Roman Empire was a hotbed. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So that he can die and rescue us from wrath and from anger and frustration. To set us free. And he gets himself caught in a snare anyway. He gets himself caught in our snare. And he's nailed to a cross for you and for me because we're mad. But he comes to you and he says, child, there is someone else who can rule your life who is better than anger. And he reaches out to you with a nail-scarred hand that was put there by angry people. Take his hand. But you can only take his hand as you let go of the things that make you mad. You can't hold on to both. Will you put your faith in him? Will you trust him to give you the peace that you so desperately need? Or will you continue to cling to your anger and continue to choke the life out of every group you're a part of, every relationship you're in, and your very own life at the end of things? It's not worth it. Anger demands your whole body, and it takes the whole body of Christ to control it. Will you give it to him? Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have given us a great gift in your Son. And Lord, frankly, confessionally, we look at anger as something that's not that bad. As long as we don't hurt anybody, as long as we don't hit anybody, as long as we don't strike anybody, it's not that big of a deal. Lord, I pray that today in our heart of hearts we would see that it's a huge deal. I pray that you would forgive us for overlooking wrath as this sin. I pray for those that maybe are in situations where anger is ruling their lives. For those who are angry, Lord, I pray that you would give them peace this day. I pray that you would give them humility to set them free. I pray that they would seek help. And Lord, for those who are under the oppression of those who are angry, Lord, I pray that you would protect them. And I pray that you would give them rescue. Deliver us from our own anger as you delivered us from your wrath through your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.